In the ACCA Advanced Financial Management or AFM exam, three methods are required in the syllabus to calculate the cost of equity using the dividend growth model, CAPM model, and also the M&M proposition number two. So it means that the company sells shares to the investor who buys shares. So this means that company in technical terms is called issuer and the company needs to pay dividend to the investor or to the shareholders. Paying dividend simply means it will be a cost to the issuer reflecting in the cost of equity. On the flip side, the investor will be called as buyer buying shares from the issuer and the buyer will require return from the company, for example, in the form of dividend or capital gain. In other words, buying shares at low price, expecting to sell at a higher price later on. So to the investor, this is called yield. And of course, from the exam's point of view, we are required to calculate the cost of equity from the issuer's point of view. And of course, this would just to be the same as the yield from the investor's point of view. Now, let's focus these from the issuer's point of view there. For example, using dividend growth model. So we are saying that what would be a cost to the business if you were to sell shares to the investor? Well, you need to pay dividend. And this means that the dividend will be your cost which means your cash outflow. So here we are given the formula here. Let's see a numerical example here. For example, the current dividend per share or DPS is $0.1 here. But in order for the shareholder to get that return of 0.1, the shareholder would need to pay $1 to buy the share. It's like the return on investment, something like that, because for the investor, in order to get that 0.1 of the dividend, they will need to invest $1 in to buy the share, which means the current share price will be $1 per share. And the company will expect the dividend to grow at 5% per year into the future, because the company would not keep the dividend to be constant, but trying to grow that up in order to attract more investment in the future. Now, for such a business, issuing shares, so what would be its cost, which means the cost of equity. If I were to slot the numbers into the formula in the dividend growth model here, the current dividend per share of 0.1 expecting to grow at 5%, which means times by 1 plus 5% there, we have to invest your money in, so that's what I mean by the share price in the denominating the calculation of $1 here, and plus the growth rate of 5% there. So this means that the cost to the business, or to, to the issuer, will be 15.5% there. So this model only assumes that the only element that would drive up the cost of equity would be in the form of dividend, but ignoring other market factors. So for example, if for the, for the investor, they can see that other companies may be offering a return if the investor buys shares from other companies at, let's say, 16% there, you're simply offering like 15.5% of return in the form of dividend. It is not attractive, okay, from the investor's point of view. It does not really consider the expected return from the investor or from the market. And this is why later on we will introduce the CAPM or capital asset pricing model to solve that particular problem. At the same time, we assume that 5% of the dividend growth rate will be constant forever. But in fact, that we may be increasing our dividend only at 4% as the actual growth rate, perhaps in the future, who knows, when we make the estimate at this point in time. 
So make sure that always state your assumptions in the AFM exam if you're using the model and this will earn you potentially professional marks. So make sure learn these two assumptions to this model here. Now, let's see the capital asset pricing model. As I said before, the capital asset pricing model assumes that not only the dividend would drive up the cost to the business issuing shares, but also to benchmark against the expected return from the market as a whole. And this is why, for example, from a numerical example's point of view, we take the return from the, for example, government security as the risk free rate of 3% there, and we benchmark the return from the market being 7%. So, in other words, if for any investors, if they were to invest their money in buying shares in the open market, the return that they can get per year would be approximately 7%. It really depends on how you benchmark that return, for example, against the Standard & Poor's 500 index and something like that. So therefore, the level of risk that we are willing to take, that the premium that we are willing to accept would be 4% there, because we take 7% as the expected return, minus if I were to suffer no risk at all, I can get a guarantee of 3% from the government. So this means that I can accept 4% as the premium, which means the equity risk premium or the market risk premium. Okay, we slot that into the formula. So in other words, we take the risk-free rate of 3% as the bottom line here, and we plus the beta factor of 1.2. The beta of 1.2 simply means if I were to invest my money into this share, if the market return increases by 1%, my share return will increase by 1.2%, higher than the market. Alternatively, if the return from the market decreases by 1%, my share that I invest in will decrease more by 1.2%. That will be more risky than the market average. So plus 1.2 for the level of premium that I'm willing to accept there, so the cost of equity to the business will be 7.8% there. So make sure that you always state the assumption related to CAPM. It only considers systematic risk. So in other words, the economic risk happened in the market, affecting all the companies in turn. So in other words, when we are using CAPM to calculate the cost of equity, we are assuming that investors are holding well-diversified portfolios to minimise the unsystematic risk, i.e. the research and development risk. Alternatively, the risk that the CEO may leave the business. So one company performing really well, and one company performs poorly, and these two companies' risks would be offset against each other. So in other words, we only suffer from systematic risk if we are applying campaign formally here. Alternatively, it clearly or explicitly includes the risk in the calculation not just assuming that the dividend will be the only factor driving up the cost, but also we are benchmarking against the expected return from the market. So this is a better approach from my perspective compared to the dividend growth model in calculating a cost of equity. The final model, again, the formula is given by the examiner, is to apply the Modigliani and Miller's preposition number two formally in computing that cost of equity. Especially if our company has no debt at all, we may be willing to take on additional project or new project, for example. We may be finding a target company with its cost of equity directly, but we need to get rid of this gearing or financial risk from a target company in order to calculate our cost of equity, which does not reflect the financial risk at all, which will only reflect the business risk, which means ungeared. 
So in other words, okay, let's see an example here. We are given the target company's geared cost of equity, which means the target company's cost of equity because the target company has debt in issue. And therefore, of course, if I were to see that you've got debt, and from the shareholder's point of view, I would demand a higher return. So cost of equity geared being 16.83% there. We are given a tax rate. We are given, before considering any taxes, the cost of debt being 4.76 there. And we are given also the target company's gearing ratio of 1.275 as the debt divided into equity. So we are given these information already and we need to work out the ungeared cost of equity reflecting the proposed investment project without considering any financial risks at all. So if that's the case then okay because yes we can work this out as the cost of equity which is ungeared by slotting information into this formula, and later on, yes, we may be considering also the free cash flows to equity, and to divide this into the cost of equity, so you can arrive at the company value later on. Now, slot this into the formula, we are given 16.83% as the cost of equity, which is geared, the tax rate being 25% there, and the KD before deducting any taxes being 4.76%. And we are also given the gearing, D, the value of debt divided into the value of equity, being 1.275. So we can work out the cost of equity, which is ungeared, being 11% there. The assumption related to MM per position number two will be to assume the market is perfect. So this means that. There'll be no insider dealing. At the same time, the information is transparent to all investors in the open market. However, this is unlikely in practice. At the same time, it assumes there'll be no bankruptcy costs at all. Because what if there'll be bankruptcy costs, if you were to take on additional debt, this would effectively drive up the cost of equity or the required return from the investor because they may see that the company will be more risky and therefore they may require a higher return. However, we don't assume any bankruptcy issues related to the company raising finance. Uh, this would be one of the disadvantages that we can always comment on in the AFM exam. So make sure they are ready in order to calculate the cost of equity. Yes, we've got three ways. The DGM, CAPEN, and M&M per position number two there. So my name is Steve Chen, the fellow member of ACCA. Congratulations of passing the cost of equity chapter here. And I'm sure this helps you with your AFM exam. And I look forward to your exam success soon. Bye for now then. APC, accounting for your future.